Well, we're joined by former MP Rory Stewart, who also was uh, in Cabinet, who uh, stood against Boris Johnson in the last Conservative leadership election in 2019. Uh, welcome to you. Um, well, we've had weeks of Partygate, haven't we? It's, it's followed us from 2020 in 2021 into 2022. Uh, far from going away, there are those that are predicting it could be the downfall of the Prime Minister. Do you agree? What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think it certainly should be, because it should be the last nail in the coffin, because this is a country which has had one of the worst COVID death rates and one of the poorest economic performances in the developed world. In a way, it's, it's ironic that what seems to be bringing down the Prime Minister is the Downing Street Party rather than the record of bad government over the last year and a half. If you were in his position and uh, were able to, to make the decision, would you resign? I hope so, yes. I believe politicians should resign and I can't see what future that he has. He may be able to survive for another few months, but he is badly wounded and... Essentially, in order to uh, be a leader, you need credibility. You need supporters, you need energy, you need enthusiasm, you need confidence. And those were, of course, things that Boris Johnson had in great, great excess over the last few years, and he's lost it. And it's very, very difficult to see that returning and very difficult to see him being a credible leader again. Uh, and what did you make of Christian Wakefield crossing the floor? Seemingly, it, it might have, have backfired because it seems to have sort of bolstered uh, Conservative MPs uh, with, with tales of, of some actually withdrawing letters. I think that's right. I think the sense in any party of party loyalty is very strong. So the rebels that were moving against Boris Johnson will have wanted to feel that they were moving against Boris Johnson, but not against the Conservative Party. So when they saw one of their colleagues cross the floor, that will have taken them aback. But that may in the end, turn out not to be a good thing for the Conservative Party because it may just prolong the very painful last days of Boris Johnson and end up damaging the Conservative Party brand even more. Are you surprised that the Prime Minister has got himself into this, this state, into this mess? Uh, not at all. Um, he, we should all have expected this. He's been a very famous public figure for 30 years. The British public has spent 30 years focusing on the fact that he lies, that he's disorganised, that he betrays almost every personal commitment that he has. He was manifestly unsuited to be Prime Minister from the beginning, and it's very, very disturbing that a great country like Britain should have chosen somebody so unsuitable for the role. And is this about an individual or the, the, the traits and characteristics that you describe, are they apt as well to describe the Conservative Party? I think it tells us something about the system, not just the Conservative Party, the Labour Party as well. It's, these are party systems which have got worse and worse in Britain because what they're fundamentally about is winning, not running the country. So the, the reason people selected Boris Johnson is because they thought he could win a big majority. And the risk is that even if they were to get rid of Boris Johnson, they will select somebody else purely on the basis of whether or not they will win a big majority. We need to get beyond that and we need to start selecting politicians who are serious, who are credible and who do their jobs responsibly. And that, that's a job not just for politicians, that's a job for the media and the public to make sure that we vote and support people who are good at doing their jobs. And today, more pressure on the PM with allegations of blackmail and intimidation. Is that something that that you recognise as methods used by the, uh, the parliamentary whip? Yes, this is all part of the same system, which is that in the end, what's been built are these machines which are about winning and loyalty. And the whips will do all they can to try to defend the prime minister. And it's a very ruthless, uh, often humiliating process where MPs who may have come from ordinary life, they may have been people who in previous lives were journalists or business people or army officers, they end up in parliament and they are put through this extraordinary hazing process of which the whips are part of trying to enforce loyalty to the leader. And this I think is dangerous because it takes away from the question of people voting with their consciences and trying as best they can to work out what's best for the country. And I think that's happening here again now. You ran against the, the Prime Minister to be leader of the Conservative Party. What, what has been your personal experience of whips? My experience of whips is that the British system is very much set up. It's a sort of elective dictatorship, 
a prime minister comes in, doesn't matter whether it's uh, Tony Blair or Gordon Brown or David Cameron or Theresa May or Boris Johnson, and the whip's job is to deliver their will and their manifesto. And they will do it largely by using promotion. One of the problems in British government is that the reason that people often become ministers or don't become ministers is not on the basis of their knowledge or their skill at doing a job. It's based on their loyalty, whether or not they do what the whips want. Now, that's fine for getting the government business through, and there's an argument for that. People want to get government business through effectively, but it does mean that you end up with ministers who are often not very well suited for the jobs that they're occupying. Uh, Christian Wakefield, uh, the, the Tory MP who crossed the floor, as we said, um, he substantiated the claims by saying he was threatened and uh, with not getting a secondary school in his constituency. I mean, that's, that's extremely damning, isn't it? Yeah, and that's completely inappropriate. The decisions made by ministers on the allocation of a secondary school must be based on genuine need. It is grotesque to suggest that the government will deprive a constituency of a secondary school on the basis of the way that an MP is voting in the chamber. I think that's not acceptable. And I think if this is happening, there needs to be a very, very clear reinforcement of what should already be in the ministerial code, which is decisions on that form of investment must be made objectively on the basis of need. They cannot be part of some pork barrel politics of buying political favours. And um, would you expect an investigation now into these claims that, that have been made? Potentially, yes. Although, as we see, whenever these investigations happen, they seem to get stuck in a morass of ambiguity and equivocation. So it's very, very difficult to see much coming out of these investigations at the end. But certainly, this behaviour is not good. And British politics would be much better off if we got beyond these sorts of behaviours, these sorts of games. It's not healthy. And look, I was... It, it's difficult for me to talk about these things. Obviously, I was defeated by Boris Johnson's leadership election. So... I'm aware when I'm saying these things, I may be saying them partly out of bitterness and disappointment, and I'm no longer a member of the Conservative Party, so maybe you need to take everything that I say with a pinch of salt. But I think the public as a whole senses that there is something wrong. There's something deeply wrong with the British political system, and that's not just about Boris Johnson. That's about all these political games, and in the end, it comes down to the fact that politics is seen too much as a game and not enough as a real vocation, not enough as being about running the country well. Finally, on, on the, the Prime Minister, do you predict that he will hang on, that he will stay? I think he'll try to hang on as long as he can, but I believe that he is now fatally wounded as a Prime Minister. It's almost impossible. If you see uh, Beth Rigby's Sky, great Sky interview with him, you see somebody who has lost the confidence to lead. And I think it's going to be very difficult for him to recover from this. Uh, let's talk about Ukraine and bringing your experience in the, the Foreign Office. How have you read President Biden suggesting that the degree to which Russia invades will dictate the response, i.e. Uh, an incursion being not quite as bad as a, a full invasion and therefore the response not being to that level? Well, th this is unbelievably serious. And in a way, as we're distracted by parties in Downing Street, this issue is much, much bigger. Russia is trying to do all it can to destabilize the West and the United States. And its move against Ukraine is part of a much, much bigger Russian move. Putin believes that the West is weak. He believes that Russia and China's star is rising. And he is going to do all he can to get his hands on Ukraine. And what Biden said was extremely dangerous and entirely daft. It's almost inconceivable that a leader would say something like that. The, uh, the White House have sought to clarify his comments. Uh, they said if any assembled Russian units move across the Ukrainian border, that is an invasion. Uh, let there be no doubt at all that if Putin makes his choice, Russia will pay a, a heavy price. Uh, but, but, but as you say, what, what, what he did say earlier has, has gone out there. How will that be interpreted by Vladimir Putin? Is that a green light to him? Putin will see it as further confirmation of what he believes, which is that there is no real conviction. It's not just President Biden. He also will have seen Emmanuel Macron's statements where Macron is talking about the EU coming up with its own approach independent of NATO to Russia. All of this will convince him that he can get the best of all worlds. He can threaten to invade, he can get a whole series of concessions, and what he's really gonna to want to do is effectively take over Ukraine without having to fight. What he wants to do is to try to bully the West into agreeing that they won't defend Ukraine and then effectively 
take power in Ukraine through his proxies. And at the moment, unless somebody steps up and unless there's any real conviction and unless we're actually serious about providing, unfortunately, arms to the Ukrainian people, we will find ourselves in that situation. Uh, and you think, seriously, that has to be the, the next step to, to arm the Ukrainian people? Yes, partly because the only people who are actually likely to have the will and the credibility and the resilience to fight the Russians will be the Ukrainians themselves. And therefore, probably the only option remaining, I'm very sorry this is the case, right? We had many, many other options over the last 10 years, but we've gone through all of them through weakness and indecision. Almost the only options remaining now are to provide the arms for the Ukrainians to defend themselves. So you hold no hope for remaining talks? I think the talks are a waste of time. Putin is not sincere in these talks. Right? There's no point talking with somebody who's issued that kind of ultimatum. It's quite clear what Putin wants to do, which is to humiliate and weaken the West and try to get his hands on Ukraine without fighting. There's no form of concessions which can be made to Putin which are going to have any realistic positive result. They're just going to weaken our position further. It's a very uh, depressing picture that you paint. So simply that the West sits and waits for Putin to invade. Well, the, the actually, in all of this, Britain is, and, you know, having been rude about the Prime Minister, I should pay tribute to the Defence Secretary. Britain has been more consistent, clearer, and more resilient in its response to Russia and Ukraine than the United States and other European partners. But unfortunately, Britain alone is nowhere in a position to be able to fight a Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I don't think economic sanctions are going to frighten Vladimir Putin. They had almost no impact on him when they were imposed after the invasion of Crimea. So I'm afraid we're back, that's 2015. So I'm afraid we are in a world in which Putin is in a strong position because of 10 years Rory of Western Stewart, weakness. Thank you so much for sharing your views with us.